Hello, everybody. Donald Trump was supposed to be here tonight. <laughs> but then he heard that I was saying a lot of mean things about him as I went across the country promoting the book, and he said, I'm not going. <laughs> a Facebook friend of mine said that, Rick, this is great timing for your book. And then he added, of course, the decline and fall of Western civilization is also what we're witnessing, so maybe you could have tried to arrange for something else to happen, but it's good for my book, so what, what can I say? All right, tonight I'm going to do two things. I'm gonna horrify you, and I'm gonna entertain you, and we're gonna start off by horrifying you. So let's begin. Only one in five Americans know that we have 100 U.S. Senators. I was over at Microsoft yesterday and I said to them, I said, I don't have to do the math for you, you guys are math geniuses. That is a very low number. Only two in five know we have three branches of government. A majority of the American people cannot name the three branches of government. More horrifying facts. A majority believe that Barack Obama raised their taxes in his first two years when he actually cut taxes for 95% of Americans. 72% believe that the country was in recession five years after the recession ended. Wow. Even more horrifying facts. In 2008, a majority didn't know what country Barack Obama was born in. A majority. This is not GOP voters. This is all voters. Today, 43%, today, 43% of GOP voters believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim. And now we get to the most horrifying facts. A majority of the American people believe that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11 and that was the reason that we attacked. 42% today believe that WMD were found in Iraq. Eight years ago, alarmed by these kinds of statistics, I wrote this book, Just How Stupid Are We? It was an Amazon bestseller, but alas, even as I was going around the country declaring, we have a 10 alarm fire in our hands and we have to do something about this, still I didn't seem able to convince a lot of people that we really have a problem. Then Donald Trump came along. Thank you, Donald, for making my case for me. Are we worse off now? <laughs> Are we worse off now than we were decades ago? Yes. And in this book, I explain the history, and I'm a historian, so I'm going to just relate very, very quickly what that history is. Three primary developments led to us having such a low rate of information about what's going on in our politics. Number one, the decline of labor unions. Working people used to be able to take cues from labor union leaders. They can't do that anymore because they're not members of labor unions. Very few people are. Number two, political parties have declined dramatically. And it used to be, back in your grandfather's day, that people could take cues from their party leaders. And these weren't the people at the top. These were the guys who were precinct captains on your own block. And you could ask them, hey, Joe, who's good for the working man? Who's good for me? You can't do that anymore because the party system has collapsed um, to where we see it today. It's mostly political parties or money generating machines to buy ads on television and not much more than that. Third and the most important development of the last few decades has been television. Before 1965, a majority of the American people got most of what they know about politics from newspapers. Since 1965, it's been from television. And I can tell you, as a veteran of television, television is not a great transmitter of information. It's wonderful for doing all kinds of things, but it doesn't transmit the story of what's going on in Iran, what's going on in the economy very well, and so it creates a problem. But I wanted to know, after my book came out, how is it possible that we have 86 billion neurons in our brain and we can't do better than we're doing? This was the mystery I set out to solve five years ago and I spent the last five years working on this. I decided to look to science for answers even though I'm a historian. 
And I found the answers I was looking for in evolutionary psychology, political psychology, neuroscience, social psychology, biology. Everything I learned kept coming back to one thing, our instincts. That seems to be what the problem is. So that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening. Here's an example of our instincts at work. This is my 1965 sixth grade class in Hohokus, New Jersey. And I gave this talk yesterday at Microsoft, and people said, oh, you've got to show where you are. So that's me right there. Yeah. Okay. I did, I did have my Apple Mac there, and nobody gave me any grief. It was okay. They were very fine with that. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Hohokus, New Jersey. Oh, exactly. Yeah, no. And uh, I'm Jewish, and we were the only Jewish family in town, too. So this was a really waspy neighborhood. All right, it's uh, September 1965. We had just moved into this WASP uh, community, uh, which back in the 1950s didn't even allow Jews. They had a sign out on Route 17, restricted, which meant no Jews allowed. So uh, we were kind of uh, social pioneers in uh, moving in in 1965. Well, we move into the uh, neighborhood. I'm starting off in school. I don't really have any friends except for one friend. And of course, you're a new kid in school, you really want to keep a low profile. You don't want to do anything wrong. All right, it's the beginning of the year. Mr. Maloney, you can see him over there on the, uh, if I can figure out this gizmo, there he is over there on the right side. And he's in the front of the classroom, and I come in through the door, which is in the back of the classroom, and all of a sudden, I look up, and I see Mr. Maloney go like this. Mr. Shankman, the barn doors are open. I have no idea what he's talking about. My best new friend, Brian O'Hurley, is sitting in the back row, and he says, Rick, you're fly, you're fly. I look down, oh my god. I run out into the hallway, I zip up, I come back in. Nine months go by. It's now June, the end of the school year. I don't know if you can guess where I'm going with this. I'm now standing in the front of the room, and I see Mr. Maloney come in through the back door. And yes, and I scream, Mr. Maloney, the barn doors are open. <laughs> Sheer pandemonium in the class, as you can imagine. 40 years later, I can still, I'm getting red in my face now as I'm telling you the story because it was hilarious. Okay, what was going on there? I wasn't a bad kid. This is not a bad kid. And I can even prove I wasn't a bad kid. I graduated from eighth grade elementary school in Hohokus, and here's the proof. Why am I telling you this story? We rely on our instincts. We feel good when we do. But our instincts don't always work. My instinct there was a little act of mini revenge, right? That's what was going on there. They don't always work. None of man's fantasies of evil can compare with the reality of Jaws. 100 years ago, in the New Jersey beach towns of southern New Jersey, there was the worst series of shark attacks in American history. Over a two-week period, four people were killed in shark attacks. It was the basis of the story told in Jaws. What happened? Well, the hotels emptied out. The economy tanked in those towns because nobody wanted to go swimming and risk death. Our instincts worked beautifully. Everybody fled the beach that summer. That made sense. Four months later, Woodrow Wilson was up for re-election in 1916, 100 years ago. And what happened? He had been the governor of New Jersey. He had been the president of Princeton, which is located in New Jersey. He had one election in 1912 in New Jersey. The people there had given him uh, a majority of the vote. 
and he won in New Jersey again, everywhere but in those small beach towns. He lost decisively there. What happened? Can you guess? Here's what, here's what happened. And we only learned this a few years ago when a social scientist by the name of Chris Aiken, who teaches at Princeton, decided to investigate and dug through some old musty records and figured it out. These people were upset not because Woodrow Wilson didn't help them with the shark attacks. He couldn't do anything as president of the United States about shark attacks. But they were in a bad, foul mood, and they wanted to lash out at somebody for what had happened over the summer when the economy tanked and all those people fled. So they took it out on him as the incumbent in this election. Sometimes our instincts don't work. Right? <laughs> we crave sweets. It leads to obesity, the number one threat to our health. There's a mismatch. Why don't our instincts work all the time? Our brain was designed to solve the problems that we faced in the Stone Age when we lived as hunter-gatherers. This was a two and a half million year long period. That's when the brain developed. And those hunter-gatherers didn't face the problems that we face in the 21st century. And that's the problem. Now, some of the problems are the same. Jack the Ripper on a dark street corner is the same problem as facing a tiger in the jungle. And you have the same kind of reaction. And it's the proper reaction. But many problems aren't the same. And my radical conclusion in political animals is that in politics in particular, you can almost never unquestioningly go with your instincts. Four problems I identify in the book. The first one is apathy. The second one, failure to read politicians correctly. Number three, the failure to reward politicians who tell us the truth. And four, the failure to show empathy when clearly empathy is called for. So let's start with problem number one, apathy. In the 24 midterm elections just two years ago, only 37% of eligible voters voted. The question is why? A clue to the answer lies with these guys. These are hunter-gatherers from the Amazon. Hunter-gatherers don't show signs of apathy. They care about who's running things. And this makes sense if you think about it. It's the people they live and work with. Their leaders aren't living off in some remote area thousands of miles away. They're the people they live with and they work with. And what do they do all the time? The same thing we do all the time. We gossip about the people who are around us. And they gossip naturally about their leaders. This is what human beings do. Gossip is how we're designed to do politics. By nature, we are social creatures and we love to gossip. We spend two-thirds of our social interactions gossiping. I didn't just make up that statistic. That's based on real research. Gossip is important. It's how we bond as primates. Chimpanzees groom. We gossip and smile and laugh. I do have to point out this guy right over here. That is just the cutest. <laughs> I mean, I'd be bonding with that little fellow over there. Here's the problem. We are built for small, intimate groups of about 150 people. And that's who we care to gossip about. When social scientists investigated, they found that 150, in Malcolm Gladwell's wonderful phrase, he calls it the magic number, the magic 150. Uh, when Brigham Young was taking the pioneers west across the country, he broke them up into groups of 150, that seemed to work well. Employees are happiest in groups of about 150 or somewhat less. Church congregations divide after they reach about 150. It's no wonder we're often apathetic. We don't live in communities of 150. We live in communities composed of millions of people. And you can't groom or smile and laugh with millions of people. That's a real problem. Let's take a quick look at the brain. 
So you can see the neocortex there. That's the folded gray matter part of the brain. That's where all the higher order functioning of human beings takes place. The ratio of the neocortex to the rest of the brain tells you how smart a species is. We're the smartest of all the animals on the planet, and the ratio of the neocortex to the rest of the brain is the highest in human beings. And it gets smaller as you go lower down the scale. Our brain can only handle about 150 social relationships. We can't handle millions. We can't, have, can't keep track of millions of people in our heads. We max out at about 150. This is a discovery of Robin Dunbar, who I want to give credit to. He's a, a British social scientist. He figured this out, and it's really an amazing insight because it explains this. Inside this skull is a being who cares by instinct for only a small number of people. This is why turnout rates at elections are often so low. Now you know why. It's because of the limitations of the human brain. Let me take a quick sip of water. And now we'll begin the second problem. And I'm sure you're going to have questions about this. We'll address them at the end. The failure to read politicians correctly. This is a huge problem. You recognize this guy? We One other thing wrong. I probably should tell you, because if I don't, they'll probably be saying this about me too. We did get something a gift after the election. A man down in Texas heard Pat in the radio mention the fact that our two youngsters would like to have a dog. And believe it or not, the day before we left on this campaign trip, we got a message from the Union Station in Baltimore saying they had a package for us. We went down to get it. You know what it was? It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he'd sent all the way from Texas. Black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Check. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. But just let me say this last word. Regardless of what happens, I'm going to continue this fight. I'm going to campaign up and down in America until we drive the crooks and the communists and those that defend them out of Washington. And remember, folks, Eisenhower is a great man, believe me. That's the famous checker speech. And I wanted to play a long section of it so that you can really see Richard Nixon almost seems like a human being. <laughs> we read him wrong for decades. Now, Democrats, of course, say, well, he never fooled me, right? But he fooled a majority of the American people. They elected him vice president twice. They elected him president twice. The second time in an overwhelming landslide that took place after the Watergate burglary had already started making news headlines. This is a very strange failure. Stone Age man had to read people well to stay alive, right? So why didn't we inherit an ability to read these people? You would think that there's not a mismatch in this case. We are born with the ability to recognize faces. Uh, this is me. <laughs> a baby at nine minutes old can recognize the human face. Here's how we know it. If you, th if you show a baby an image like this with just three dots arranged like a face, the baby will stare at it and be riveted. If you show them this, they turn away, they're bored. There is a part of the human brain that's called the fusiform gyrus, and it is specifically designed to help us recognize human faces. So we should be pretty good at recognizing people and reading them. That's the whole point, right? That's, that's why we would have this ability, so that we can read other people. We have great 
confidence in our ability to read people and admit it. You see this picture and you have an instant reaction. And you have faith and confidence in your reaction. Look at this guy over here on the right. You just knew you had to worry about him, right? I mean, look at that face. Here's the problem with this. Evolution gave us this confident feeling because in the Stone Age, we lived in small communities where we really did know people around us. We worked with these people. We lived with these people in these small hunter-gatherer communities. So when we were reading their faces, it wasn't just our instant reaction. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they smiling? No, we had context. We knew them. We knew their character. Here's our problem. We see folks on TV, and we think we know them because they're familiar. But we lack that context. We're not living with them and working with them. That's the problem. Our brain is playing a trick on us. There have been lots of studies that demonstrate this. This one involving Harvard students. They showed these uh, Harvard students, a couple of hundred of them a few years ago, video clips, 10 second video clips of guys who were running for governor. The students were asked who they thought had won. 58% of the time they were right. This suggested to social scientists that an awful lot of voters are just doing what these students are doing. They're taking quick reactions to politicians that they see, having an instantaneous assessment, and then deciding they like somebody, and they're voting for them. They're sizing people up by their looks. Now, this was 10-second video clips. At Princeton, they decided to go one better and just show people headshots of politicians this time running for candidates running for the U.S. Senate. Not video, just headshots for one second. And this time, they had a 70% prediction rate. Holy cow! How fast do we make up our mind this fast? In 167 milliseconds. That's how fast you make up your mind about somebody when you first lay eyes on them. That's faster than it takes to blink. If you give people more time, they don't rethink their assessment. They just dream up more reasons why their first instinct was right. I am not saying that we can't learn something from watching candidates on TV. Sometimes a little clip like this one of John Edwards will tell you a whole lot. Not many were taken in by Nixon in this crowd, I'd bet, but John Edwards, our instincts told us we could trust this guy. Alas, we didn't have this clip. Maybe we would have reached a different conclusion, but we didn't have this clip available. <laughs> he just goes on and on. They play some uh, wonderful music. If you uh, search for this on YouTube, it's really, it's just fantastic. Uh, you know, just how pretty am I? That's the, that's the song that they play from uh, West Side Story. Would studying help? James Fishkin is a social scientist at Stanford, and for years, he has been arguing that what we just need to do is get the facts in voters' hands. He set up a study group of voters, and he said back in uh, 2004 when Edwards was first running for president, and he had them examine videos and read magazine articles and surf the web and get all kinds of information. And who did his well-educated voters pick as the best candidate for president of the United States that year, they picked John Edwards. Not everybody was fooled by John Edwards. Charles Peters was the founding editor of the Washington Monthly. He's regarded almost as a journalistic god in Washington, DC. He's now a very old man, but um, in his day, his opinions really counted. And here's the thing. He knew that John Edwards was not right for the presidency. He knew it because he had been told by a friend that just a few years earlier when Edwards was running for the Senate, you remember he ran for president just a few years after he was elected to the Senate. He's like Cruz and also Obama. And Charles Peters heard that when Yitzhak Rabin's wife 
was going to headline a function and Edwards was told that he should attend, Edwards told his uh, handlers, Yitzhak Rabin, who's that? He was running for the US Senate and he'd never heard of Yitzhak Rabin. Charles Peters concluded, this guy's not ready to be president of the United States. This is just a few years later. But how many of us have access to people like Charles Peters who get this inside scoop? We don't. So we go on the basis of seeing people on TV. What's the lesson in all this? The lesson is we shouldn't rely on our skill at reading people when it comes to politics. We think we know a lot about presidents because we see them on television, but it's an illusion. Just because you see people a lot doesn't mean you know them. Take Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan for decades was before the American people. We thought we knew him. He was an actor, TV host, politician. We didn't know him. In 1980, there's this incredible clip, which I'm going to show you. This really convinced people that they knew who Ronald Reagan was after they saw this. May you have the first question for the question. You asked me if you could make an announcement first. And I asked you for permission to make an announcement myself. Would, uh, would the sound man please turn Mr. Reagan's mic off? And then... Is this on? Mr. Green, you turn that mic You asked for me if you would. I am paying for this microphone, Mr. Green. I've seen this a hundred times. I don't know about you, but it's still, every single time I watch it, I get this very strong emotional reaction to it. It is very rare in American politics that you see raw emotion like that, anger. That was genuine anger. And what happened when people saw that in National New Hampshire in 1980? They felt they connected with him. They knew who he was. Here's the irony of that. The people who were closest to Ronald Reagan say they never knew who he was. His son, Ron Reagan Jr., who lives here in Seattle, put out a memoir a few years ago where he said, I never understood my father. I never really felt I knew him. His biographer, Edmund Morris, spent 10 years on a biography of Ronald Reagan. At the end of it, wrote this whole long thing. He had so much trouble understanding who Ronald Reagan was that Morris finally put himself in the story, created a character, kind of novelized this biography to try to suggest who Ronald Reagan was. And the American people had the chutzpah to think that they understood who Ronald Reagan was. The people closest to him didn't know who he was. Our brain tricks us. Our brain, I, oh, I love this. I had to put, put this in just because Barney watching TV is wonderful. Our brain should send up a flare when we watch someone on TV and have an instantaneous reaction and think that we know somebody. And that flare should go off every single time you get that instinctive reaction. Anytime you think you know someone on TV because you've seen them a lot, that flare should go off. And if you remember nothing else from uh, this talk, remember the flare when you're watching TV and you have that instantaneous reaction. I'm not saying not to consider your reaction. We're gonna have a reaction if we see Carly Fiorina come on TV. Believe me, I have that reaction every single time. But you can't trust that human reaction because you're missing the context. Problem number three, the failure to reward politicians who tell us hard truths. We naturally think that we humans want the truth. I am here to convince you this is just a crazy idea. Do we want the truth out when we've done something wrong? No. Do we want other people telling us the truth when the truth hurts? No. I think we need to face a very hard truth, and that is that we just aren't the lovers of truth that we claim. Which brings me to Washoe. She was the first chimpanzee to learn sign language. She knew hundreds of signs. She lived just across the mountains over in Ellensworth. She taught other primates how to sign, which is really amazing. One of them was Lucy. Roger Fouts was the social scientist who trained Washaw, and he discovered one day that Lucy 
had defecated in the living room of the private home where she was living. She was raised like a human being. They even put her up in diapers and clothes. Lucy and Roger had this remarkable exchange using sign language. He's discovered, remember, she's just defecated. What that? Lucy, what that? Roger, you know, what that? Lucy, dirty, dirty. Roger, who's dirty, dirty? Lucy, Sue, a grad student. <laughs> Roger, it not Sue, who's that? Roger. <laughs> Roger, no, not mine, whose? Finally, the truth, Lucy, dirty, dirty. Sorry, Lucy, and she hung her head. What this suggests is that deception is ingrained in primates like us. Humans and chimpanzees are very, very close. We share 98% of our DNA. Monkeys share 96% of our DNA. This is all part of who we are. This is what the genetics revolution of the last 20 years has been teaching us. The lesson, we shouldn't expect presidents to tell the truth when they're in a jam any more than we should expect Lucy to tell the truth. This is what primates do, and presidents are primates, and they lie. <laughs> but this doesn't mean that we're sitting ducks. I know you love my very sophisticated graphics. <laughs> my husband is out there, and he's laughing. <laughs> OK, so we're not sitting ducks. Why? Number one, we're not sitting ducks because people who lie get a reputation for lying. That really protects us. Number two, we possess powerful cheater detection software. It's like McAfee for the brain, and all of us come equipped with it. And it's essential. Otherwise, cheaters would run rampant throughout the society. An example of our cheater detection software is our incredible memory for faces. We want to remember the faces of people who cheat us. Studies show we do remember their faces better than others. We remember the faces of cheaters better than the faces of people who do us favors. Here's another example of our cheater detection software at work. It's our ability to sniff out a liar. What do cheaters do? They speak more slowly. They twitch. Their voice pitch rises. They avoid using words like I and me. They use fewer qualifiers. They'll say, when I went to the store, I took Pike Street. A truthful person will throw in lots of details. When I went to the store, it was raining. I took Pike Street. I saw a dog. If you remember nothing else from this lecture, here are some good tips on how to spot a liar. Given this cheater detection software, you'd think that we could read our presidents better. But there's a catch. The software only works if the person trying to cheat us is conscious of their deception. If they're not, like this used car salesman, they won't give off the telltale signs. And guess what? Many liars aren't conscious of their deception. They're like this used car salesman. So how do we pull this off? All of us are strangers to ourselves, to use the wonderful phrase of Timothy Wilson, a social scientist. We humans not only come with cheater detection software, we come with cheater concealment software. We play both sides in the computer virus game. Sometimes we're McAfee, and we're trying to guard against some invasion Sometimes we're the hackers trying to conceal ourselves from McAfee. Presidents lie to themselves in order to be able to lie to us. It's how they live with themselves and all the horrible compromises they make to gain power and keep it. They compromise their principles, they have to exploit their family, they sell it their friends, they reinvent themselves, they use coded racist appeals, and on and on and on. All the presidents practice deception except for George Washington. He didn't have to because he was given the office on a platter. They said, here, George, take the office. And the Electoral College unanimously elected him. That doesn't happen anymore. 
So these guys have to compete, and when they're competing, they do and say all kinds of things, horrible things, as we're seeing in this current election cycle in particular. I wrote a whole book about this, if you're interested. It's called Presidential Ambition. It's chapter and verse in Skullduggery. Many times, presidents know very well that they are guilty of deception. Richard Nixon wasn't just lying to himself about a lot of things that uh, he did wrong. Um, he knew he was doing wrong. But they convince themselves they're not to blame, that it's the situation. They're not cheaters at heart. This is what we all do. When we do something bad, we blame it on the situation. But if we see someone else do something bad, what do we do? We leap to the conclusion that they're cheaters. We don't take the context into account. This is called the fundamental attribution error. It's the central foundation of social psychology. Which leads me to this story about George Herbert Walker Bush. And remember, he's the good Bush. <laughs> when he was running for the US Senate from Texas, he was a Yankee invader, a carpetbagger in Texas. He grew up in New England and Connecticut. His father was a senator from Connecticut. He goes down to Texas. He's got to pass himself off as a true blue, red-blooded conservative. He really wasn't, but he had to pass himself off that way to win. And he sidled up close to a lot of very right-wing groups as a result, including the John Birchers. Afterwards, he lost the election, by the way. He wasn't very convincing. He confessed to his minister. He said, John, I feel really badly about what I did. I hope I never have to do it again. What was he doing? He wasn't confessing that he was a bad person. He was saying it was the situation. That's how politicians think. Let's now talk about how we think. We have all kinds of biases that cloud our thinking. Probably the most important in politics is the partisan bias. It's one of the worst of all. It stops us from thinking straight. Our brain rewards us when we ignore facts that we find upsetting. Drew Weston is a social scientist. Back in 2004, he decided he was going to try to demonstrate just how partisan our brains are, and even he was shocked by the results. He took Bush and Kerry voters, he stuck their heads into an MRI machine, and he showed them pictures of their guys, and he said, here's an example of your guy, if you were a Bush voter, with Bush being caught in some example of hypocrisy. And their brains had a kind of really interesting reaction. They took in this information that was against their guy, and then their brain immediately shunted that information that was giving them what the social scientists referred to as dissonance off to a side of their brain where it went away, and it was now off their radar. And as soon as they did that, their brains returned to a state of kind of happiness. Our brain rewards us for getting rid of information that we don't like. And the same thing happened when the Kerry voters in the MRI machine were given bad information about John Kerry, where he was caught in some hypocrisy. Our brain rewards us for ignoring evidence contrary to belief, and now science has given us the proof of it. I'm a historian. And I spent the last five years reading these science studies because there has been a scientific revolution that has taken place in the last 20 years. I was in college 40 years ago. They didn't teach this then because they didn't have the evidence. Now they do. And what I'm trying to do in this book is share it. Evolution didn't privilege the truth. It privileged survival. We want our version of the truth to prevail. When it does, we benefit and our health improves. Daniel Gilbert is a very famous uh, social psychologist at Harvard, and he refers to this as our psychological immune system. When we can get rid of information that is causing dissonance, 
we show an improvement in our physical health. We don't like dissonance. We try to get rid of it. Which brings me back to Donald Trump. Civics reformers say what we need is more facts. Facts are good. I am all in favor of facts. I am not against facts. But belief trumps facts. That's why people still believe Barack Obama is a Muslim born in Kenya. Trump supporters don't care when he's caught in lies. He tells flat out lies, more lies than anybody else, according to PolitiFact. His biggest whopper was that on 9-11, thousands of Muslims were dancing on the roofs of apartment buildings in Jersey City when they saw the Twin Towers go down. It wasn't true. His supporters don't care. Facts aren't what people care about. It's how they feel that counts. Elections in the end aren't about the candidate. They're about us. Do we feel smart or dumb in this candidate's presence? I just wrote a piece for the History News Network this past week in which I talked about Donald Trump's political genius. Even though when we think Donald Trump, we think immediately of a guy who is self-aggrandizing. Everything is about him. He puts his name on planes and helicopters and buildings. But the genius of his campaign is that it's not actually about him. It's about all those voters out there. He's the most successful of all the candidates right now in convincing people that the campaign, his campaign, is about them, not us. This is very counterintuitive, but if you think about it for a moment, you'll get it. His voters have been told by the mainstream for years, you can't think the thoughts that you're thinking. You can't be suspicious of Mexican immigrants. You can't feel that Muslims are a threat to our country. Donald Trump comes along, he's a billionaire, he's rich, he's powerful, and he seems like a smart guy, he's certainly articulate, and he's telling all these voters, you should trust your feelings. So these voters who the mainstream media like to write off as low information voters, if not dumb idiots, in his presence, they feel really smart because this rich, powerful man is validating their feelings. Trump is legitimizing how they feel. That's why he's so successful. That's one of them. I think that's the big reason why he's so successful. Here's one of his supporters. We've got people in, in positions of power who I know for a fact are liars, liars. I watch the TV, my, my president comes on the TV and he lies to me. I know he's lying. He lies all the time. Look, Frank. I don't believe any one of them, not one. I believe Donald. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm telling you, he says what I'm thinking. Exactly. Never been involved in politics, never had an interest in any of it. Now suddenly he is resonating. He is resonating with the people and he's speaking our minds, our minds. Mm -hmm. When the pundits and the experts and all the people who are supposed to be in the know and know all this stuff and they're so great, I know some of them, maybe not all, but some of them are lying to me straight to my face and I am so sick of it. <laughs> It's a long clip, but I had to share this with you. My husband and I watched this, and we couldn't believe it. He caught it first, and he showed it to me. It's, it's incredible. It's unbelievable. Trump's connecting with people through emotion, fear, fear of immigrants, fear of terrorists. But it's not just fear. He's doing something more subtle than this. He's activating an ancient instinct. It's the better be safe than sorry bias. When a fire alarm goes off, what do we do? We react. Every human being everywhere in the world, when the fire alarm goes off, you react. Why? A missed fire alarm can kill you. A false fire alarm? Meh. Okay, so it was a false fire alarm. We go back to our desk and we continue working. Trump feels real because he traffics in emotions that are real. Fear and anger. He's doing the same thing that Joe McCarthy did back in the 1950s. 
It's the exact same appeal. And no other candidate comes close to him in this. We analyze politics wrongly when we evaluate a candidate's statements as if we are rational creatures. Facts count, to be sure, but with low-information voters especially, they count for less since they know less. They have little else to go on but what they're seeing. This is why when someone says to me the human beings value the truth, I look at them like they're crazy. And that leads me to the poor story of Walter Mondale, the most naive politician in American history. Back in 1984, when he was running for president, he gave his acceptance address before the Democratic Convention. He said, quote, I'm going to raise your taxes. Reagan won't tell you he will. I just did. This sounds appealing if you're a rational voter. He lost in one of the all-time great landslides of American history. We don't want the truth, we want myths. Reagan won the Cold War. We're the best nation on earth. Abraham Lincoln wasn't a politician, he was a saint. I've written three books on myths of American history. It's all summed up in a couple of sentences there. That's what we want. We want to believe these things. We don't want the truth. Problem four, the failure to show empathy. 1% of the population are out and out psychopaths. 25% of the males, <laughs> I was not expecting a laugh. <laughs> okay. 25% of the males in prison have been identified as psychopaths. Most of us, thankfully, are not. We think of ourselves as empathic. I certainly do. I'm sure you do. Evolution favored the development of empathy. It's the only reason we can get along in groups. We think we can count on it in politics. We can't. Here's the story that illustrates this. This is uh, Ohio Senator Rob Portman. He was against gay marriage. He was one of the most fervent anti-gay marriage proponents in the United States. Then one day, his son came home from Yale, and he said, Daddy, I'm gay, and I want to get married. When it happens to you, it feels differently, and your views changed. Rob Portman changed his view on gay marriage. Think of the people who died by accident when we drop bombs. When it happens to someone else who speaks a different language, looks different, lives in a country we can't even find on a map without trouble, what do we do? We turn them into abstractions. It's very hard to be empathetic for them. You can show empathy for people in your immediate neighborhood, but it's very difficult to show empathy for these people who are really abstractions to you. They're human beings, but our brain doesn't think so. This is Linda Taylor. You may recognize the name. Ronald Reagan spent years denouncing Linda Taylor. She was the famous welfare queen who drove around in a Cadillac. She earned $150,000 a year. She used phony names and phony social security numbers. Reagan rode this story into the White House. We are born with a natural suspicion of free riders, to use the social scientist term. When we come upon somebody we think is a free rider, basically a free loader, it swamps our reasoning faculties, even in Scandinavian countries, according to the studies that I cite by Michael Bang Peterson, who's a uh, Danish social scientist, and I, I cite several of his studies in the book. Linda was never representative of welfare clients, but she came to resonate with the American people. Why? Because it was easy for Reagan to trigger an ancient cue in our brains to be suspicious of people who are free writers. And once he got the audience like that, he had them. And it didn't matter that she wasn't representative of anybody but Linda Taylor. In fact, she was so horrible that a recent Slate study found that 
she actually may have killed one of her husbands to rob him of his small fortune. I want to read this because I want to make sure I get it right. This is from the book. We think we can count on our own empathy to provide us with the necessary warmth and humanity to address issues we face in a democracy. But we can't. Our inability to do so skews public debates. It gives the advantage to the side wanting to take action to achieve a goal that inconveniences, harms, or kills people we don't know. In any public debate, a right winger can stand up and he can say, we need to carpet bomb ISIS. And he has the advantage over the liberal critics who say, whoa, you shouldn't do that. A lot of innocent people might get killed from carpet bombing. But it's very difficult to activate the empathic part of our brain when we're talking about people who dress differently, look differently, live in a country we can't find on a map. OK. All of that sounds grim. So why am I an optimist? The science has taught me there are real grounds for optimism. And what I always like to do in these talks is I first bring you really low. I make you feel like you need to slit your throat because it's hopeless. And then at the end, I like to bring you back up. So this is the part where you're going to start feeling good. <laughs> Education works. That's number one. Donald Trump is winning with low information voters. What does that tell you? Number two, biological evolution may be slow. It takes a long time for species to evolve. But cultural evolution is fast. It's change on steroids. Our culture is constantly changing. We don't have to wait for our brain to catch up with our modern ideas about how we want the world to be. Your instincts may be your instincts, but we aren't slaves to them, and you aren't slaves to them. We can change how we behave. Here's an example. 100 years ago, Jesse Washington was lynched by the people of Waco, Texas. Thousands turned out. They burned him alive. He was castrated, and they cut off his fingers. We don't do this anymore. Culture works fast. That was just 100 years ago. Think of how long man has been on Earth, millions of years. In 100 years, we went from lynching and thinking that's OK to thinking it's deplorable. That's amazing progress. Telling stories can help bring out our humanity. Stories can override our instincts. Parables work, as Jesus knew. And politicians like Ronald Reagan. That's why he went around the country telling stories all the time. If you can tell a convincing story to people, you can humanize even people who live in a faraway place. There are, however, no guarantees. And this gets me to my favorite social science study of, uh, that I came across in the last five years of all time. I think you're going to agree that it's just amazing. So they wanted to test if rich people are, like the stereotype goes, less empathic than ordinary people. So they stuck rich people into these MRI machines and measured their MPFCs, their medial prefrontal cortex, when they showed them a picture of a homeless person. And sure enough, they registered lower activity in the empathic parts of their brain. OK, you're thinking, that's interesting, but that's, that's, that's the best social science study you're citing? No, this is the best social science study I'm citing. They then had people play Monopoly with fake money. And then they took the winners of the Monopoly games with fake money and put them in an MRI machine and showed them a picture of a homeless person. And they had the same low activity as real rich people. 
I'm just flabbergasted by that. That's just amazing. But back to why I'm an optimist. <laughs> when we're reading politicians, we can remember to second guess our impressions. Remember the flare, the flare that should go off. As human beings, we don't have to go along with our instincts. If we see somebody on TV and you have an instant reaction, the flare can go off. You can say, oh, wait, I shouldn't give in to that instinctive reaction. I should maybe get some more information. I should keep an open mind here. To get past apathy, we can involve ourselves in politics. You can go to a caucus. You can come to a, a talk like this. We are going to feel what we feel, and our biases are going to skew our thinking. But we can second guess ourselves to correct for bias. The flare should go off any time you feel yourself reacting by instinct. Any time. If you feel you have an instant reaction in politics, say, whoa, does the context fit? If a politician denounces welfare, you'll know they're trying to trigger your natural suspicion of cheats. So you ought to be stopping and thinking, what's really going on here? Is this just an anecdote? Or has he got real proof that welfare is draining our budgets and these people are horrible and the society is going to collapse if we don't cut back on Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare and all the other social programs? And here's the really good news I want to end with. Our brain is designed to be real. We may not privilege the truth, but ultimately we cannot ignore threats. Our brains are threat detectors. They're set on high alert. Those fire alarms in our head are set on high alert. And when there is a steep mismatch between how we think the world works and how it actually works, in other words, when there is a mismatch between our beliefs and the real world, what happens? We grow anxious. That triggers reappraisal of our views. And that's what saves us from dogmatism. When we see glaciers collapsing, we take notice. That gives me hope on climate change. But there is a problem. Do you see the problem? We may not see enough pictures of glaciers collapsing until it's too late, right? The scientists say that with climate change, you've got to react now if we're going to save the planet. If we wait until Greenland goes under or Miami goes under, we'll have that anxiety reaction that we need. And by then, oops, sorry, you've already destroyed planet Earth. We can't always wait. Our Stone Age brain might not be up to the task at hand. Our nervous system isn't making us nervous enough about the problems that are coming down the road when we need to be nervous now. So that is a problem. There's one other problem, anger. Anger is everywhere in American politics now. And social scientists have proved conclusively that when we are in an angry mood, we don't compromise. Anger closes our minds. But what saves us from anger? Anxiety. Anxiety opens our minds. They actually proved this in the social science studies that I cite in the book. Science, therefore, is giving us an insight. We can reform our democracy if we take advantage of these lessons of science. I think all we need to teach are not facts, but these lessons that I've been talking about tonight. Teach them in schools so that people understand how their own brain works. If we can understand how we react to politicians, we can save ourselves. Thank you.